This is Tobacco Road by Erskine Caldwell. Chapter 1 Love Benzie trudged homeward through the deep white sand of the gully-washed tobacco road with a sack of winter turnips on his back. He had put him he had put himself to a lot of trouble to get the turnips. It was a long and tiresome walk all the way to Fuller and back again. The day before, Love had heard that a man over there was selling winter turnips for 50 cents a bushel, so he had started out with half a dollar that morning to buy some. He had already walked seven and a half miles, and it was a mile and a half yet back to his house at the coal chute. Four or five of the Lesters were standing in the yard looking at Love when he put his sack down and stopped in front of the house. They had been watching Love ever since he was first seen an hour before on the sand hill nearly two miles away, and now that he was actually within reach, they were prepared to stop him from carrying the turnips any farther. Love had his wife to feed and provide for, in addition to himself. Annie was careful not to allow any of the Lesters to come too close to the sack of turnips. Usually when he came by the Lester place with turnips or sweet potatoes, or for that matter, with any kind of food, he left the road half a mile from the house and made a wide circle through the fields, returning to the road a safe distance beyond. Today, though, he had to speak to Jeter about something of great importance, and he had ventured closer to the house than he had ever done before when carrying home turnips or sweet potatoes. Love's wife was G Jeter Lester's youngest daughter, Pearl. She was only 12 years old the summer before when he had married her. The Lesters watched Love closely while he stood in the middle of the road. He had dropped the sack from his shoulder, but he held the neck of it in the rigid grasp of both hands. No one in the yard had changed his position during the past 10 minutes. The next move was entirely up to Love. When Love came to the house and stopped, he had a good reason for doing so. Otherwise, he would never have to come within hailing distance. He wanted to speak to Jeter about Pearl. Pearl would not talk. She would not say a word no matter how persuasive Love tried to be, nor how angry he was. She even hid from Love when he came home from the coal shoe, and when he found her, she slipped away from his grasp and ran off into the broom sedge out of sight. Sometimes she would even stay in the broom sedge all night, remaining out there until Love went to work the next morning. Pearl had never talked for that matter, not because she could not simply, but because she did not want to. When she was at home before Love had married her, she had stayed apart from the other Lesters and rarely opened her mouth from the beginning of one day to the next. Only her mother, Ada, had been able to converse with her. And even then, Pearl had never used more than the barest of negatives and affirmatives in reply. But Ada was was herself like that. She had begun to talk voluntarily only during the past 10 years. Before then, Jeter had the same trouble with her that Love was now having with Pearl. Love asked Pearl questions. He kicked her, he poured water over her, he threw rocks and sticks at her, and he did everything else he could think of that he thought might make her talk to him. She cried a lot, especially when she was seriously hurt, but Love did not consider that as conversation. He wanted her to ask him if his back were sore and when he was going to get his hair cut and when it was going to rain again, but Pearl would not say anything. He had spoken to Jeter several times before about his troubles with Pearl, but Jeter did not know what the matter with what was the matter with her. Ever since she was a baby, she had been like that, he said, and Ada had remained untalkative until the last few years. What Jeter had not been able to break down in Ada for 40 years, hunger had. Hunger loosened her tongue, and she had been complaining ever since. Jeter did not attempt to recommend the starving of Pearl, because he knew she would go somewhere to beg food and would get it. Sometimes I think it's just the old devil in her, Love had said several times. To my way of thinking, she ain't got a scratch of religion in her. She going to hellfire when she dies, surely as day comes. Now maybe she ain't pleased with her married life, Jeter had suggested. Maybe she ain't satisfied with what you provide her with. I've done everything I can think of to make her satisfied and contented. Every week I go to Fuller on payday and buy her a pretty. I get her stuff, but she won't take none. I get her a little piece of calico, but she won't sew it. Looks like she wants something I ain't got and can't get her. I wish I knowed what it was. She's such a pretty little girl. All them long yellow curls hanging down her back sort of gets me all crazy sometimes. I don't know what's going to happen to me. 
I've got the need of pearl for a wife as bad as any man ever had. I expect she's too young yet to appreciate things, Jeter had said. She ain't grown up yet like Ellie Mae, Lizzie Bell, and Clara and the other gals. Pearl ain't nothing but a little gal yet. She don't even look like a woman so far. If I had known she was going to be like this, she is. If I had known she was going to be like she is, maybe I wouldn't have wanted to marry her so bad. I could have married me a woman who wants to be married to me. But I don't want Pearl to go now, though. I sort of got used to her around, and I'd sure miss seeing the long yellow curls hanging down her back. They make a man feel kind of lonesome some way. She sure is a pretty little girl, no matter if she does act like she does all the time. Lava had gone back home that time and told Pearl what Jeter said about her. But she sat in the chair and made no sign of answering him. Lava did not know what to do about her after that. But he had realized from that time on, she was a stuck she was a stiffy a little girl during the eight months they had been married she had grown three or four inches in height and she weighed about 15 more pounds now than she did at the beginning she still did not weigh much more than 100 pounds though she was gaining in weight and height every day what love wanted to speak to jeter about now in particular was the way pearl had of refusing to sleep with him they had been married almost a year and she still slept by herself as she had done since the first she slept by herself on a pallet on the floor, refusing to even let Love kiss her or touch her in any way. Love had told her that cows were not any good until they had been freshened, and that the reason he married her was because he wanted to kiss her and feel her long yellow curls and sleep with her. But Pearl had not even indicated that she heard him or knew what he was talking about. Next to wanting to kiss her and talk to her, Love wanted to see her eyes. Yet even this pleasure she denied him. Her pale blue eyes were always looking off into another direction when he came and stood in front of her. Love still stood in the middle of the road looking at Jeter and the other Lesters in the yard. They were waiting for him to make the first move, friendly or hostile, and mattered little to them so long as they were turnips in the sack. Jeter was wondering where Love had got the turnips. It did not occur to him that Love had bought them with money. Jeter had long before come to the conclusion that the only possible way a quantity of food could be obtained was by theft, but he had not been able to locate a turnip patch that year anywhere within five or six miles. There had been planted a two-acre field the year before over at the Peabody place, but the Peabody men had kept people out the field with shotguns then, and this year they had not even planted turnips. Why don't you come in the yard off the tobacco road, Love? Jeter said. Ain't no sense standing out there. Come in and rest yourself. Love made no reply, nor did he move. He was debating within himself the danger of entering the yard against the safety of staying where he was in the road. For the past few weeks, Love had been thinking about taking some plow lines and typing and tying, excuse me, Pearl in the bed at night. He had tried everything that he could think of so far except force, and he was still determined to make her act as he thought a wife should. He had reached the point now where he wanted Jeter's advice before going ahead with the plan. He believed Jeter would know whether it was advisable from the practical side. Since Jeter had had to contend with Ada for almost a lifetime, he knew Ada had once acted as Pearl was now doing, but Jeter had not been treated as he was treated because Ada had borne him 17 children while Pearl had not even begun to have the first one. If Jeter said it would be satisfactory to tie Pearl in bed, then he would go ahead and do it. Jeter knew more about such things than he did. Jeter had been married to Ada 40 years. Love hoped that Jeter would offer to go down to the house at the coal chute and help him tie Pearl in bed. Pearl fought back so fiercely whenever he attempted to catch her that he was afraid he would not be able to accomplish anything without Jeter's help. The Lester stood around in the yard and on the front porch waiting to see what Love was going to do next. There had been very little in the house again that day to eat. Some salty to soup Ada had made by boiling several fat back rinds in a pan of water and cornbread was all was when they had sat down to eat. There had not been enough to go around even then, and the old grandmother had been shoved out of the kitchen when she tried to conic inside. Ellie May stood behind a ch china berry tree, looking around the trunk at Love. She moved her head from one side of the tree to the other, trying to att attract Love's attention. Ellie May and Dude were the only Lester children left at home. All the others had gone away and married, some of them just leaving in a casual way as though they were only walking down to the coal chute to see the freight trains. When they failed to return within two or three days, it was known that they had left home. Dude was throwing a lopsided baseball at the side of the house and 
catching it on the rebound. The ball hit the house like a clap of thunder, rattling the loose weatherboarding until the vibration swayed the house from side to side. He threw the ball continually, the ball bounding with unfailing regularity back across the sandy yard to where he stood. The three-room house sat precariously on stacks of thin lime rock chips that had been placed under the four corners. The stones had been laid up one on top of the other, the beam spiked, and the house nailed together. The ease and simplicity with which it had been built was now evident. The center of the building sagged between the sills. The front porch had sagged loose from the house, and now a foot or more lower than it originally was, and the roof sagged in the center where the supporting rafters had been carelessly put together. Most of the shingles had rotted, and after every windstorm, pieces of them were scattered in all directions about the yard. When the roof leaked, the lusters moved from one corner of the room to, the, to another, their movements finally outlasting the duration of the rain. The house had never been painted. Jeter was trying to patch a rotten inner tube. He had said that if he could ever get all the tires on the old automobile standing up at the same time again, he would haul a load of wood to Augusta and sell it. Woodcutters were being paid $2 a load for some seasoned pine delivery in the city, but the blackjack that Jeter tried to make people buy for fuel never bought him more than 50 or 75 cents. Usually when he did succeed in getting a load of it to Augusta, he was not able to give it away. Nobody, it seemed, was foolish enough to buy wood that was tougher than iron water pipes. People argue with Jeter about his mule-like determination to sell blackjack for fuel, and they tried to convince him that, as firewood, it was practically worth worthless. But Jeter said he wanted to clear the land of the scrub oak because he was getting ready to farm it again. Love had by the time moved a few steps nearer the yard and had sat down in the tobacco road with his feet in the drain ditch. He kept one hand gripped tightly around the mouth of the sack where it had been tied together with a piece of twine. Ellie May continued to peer from behind the china berry tree, trying to attract Love's attention. Each time he glanced in that direction, she jerked her head back so he could not see her. What you got in that there crocker sack, Love? Jeter shouted across the yard. I've been seeing you come a far piece off with that there crocker sack on your back. I sure would like to know what you got inside of it. I heard it said that some people has got turnips this year. Love tightened his grip on the mouth of the sack, looking from Jeter to the next Lester in turn. He saw Ellie May peering at him from behind the china berry tree. Did you have a hard time getting what you got there in that sack, Love? Jeter said. You look like you was all out of breath. I want to say something to you, Jeter, he said. It's about Pearl. What's that girl done now, Love? Is she treating you mean some more? It's just like she always done, only I'm getting pretty darn tired of it by this time. I don't like the way she acts. I never did take it to the way she does, but it's getting worse and worse all the time. All the blank make fun of me because of the way she treats me. Pearl is just like her ma, Jeter said. Her ma used to do the queerest things in her time. Every time I want to have her around me, she runs off and won't come back when I call her. Now what I say is, what in the hell is the sense in me marrying a wife if I don't get none of the benefits? God didn't intend for it to be that way. He don't want a man to be treated like that. It's all right for a woman to sort of tease a man into doing what she wants done. But Pearl don't seem like she, to be aiming after that. She ain't teasing me to her way of thinking, but it sure does act that way on me. Right now, I feel like I want a woman who ain't so... What you got there in that there crocker sack, love, Jeter said. I've been seeing you for the past hour or longer. Ever since you came over the top of the hill, f top of that far hill yonder. Turnips, by God, love said, looking at the Lester woman. Where'd you get turnips, love? Wouldn't you like to know? I was thinking maybe we might fix up some sort of trade. Love, me and you. Now I could go down to your house and sort of tell Pearl she's got to sleep in bed with you. That's what you was aiming to speak to me about, wasn't it? You want her to sleep in the bed, don't you? She ain't never slept in the bed. It's that Durham pallet on the floor that she sleeps on every night. Reckon you can make her stop doing that, Jeter? I'd be pleased something powerful to make her do what she ain't doing. That is, if me and you can make a trade with them turnips, love. That's what I came by here for, to speak to you about Pearl. But I ain't gonna let you have none of these turnips, though. I had to pay 50 cents for this many in a sack. And I had to walk all the way to the other side of the fuller and back to fetch them. You're Pearl's daddy and you ought to make her behave for nothing. She don't pay no attention to do 
She don't pay no attention to nothing I tell her to do. By God and by Jesus, love, all the damn blasted turnips. I raised this year's warming, and I ain't had a good turnip since a year ago this spring. All my turnips has got them damn blasted green gutted worms in them, love. What God made turnip worms for, I can't make out. It appears to me like he just naturally has got it in good and heavy for a poor man. I worked all the fall last year digging up a patch of ground to grow turnips in. And then when they're getting about big enough to pull and eat, along comes these damn blasting green gutted turnip worms and bore clear to the middle of them. God has got it in good and heavy for the poor, but I ain't complaining. Love, I say, the good Lord's the good Lord knows best about turnips. Some of these days, he'll bust loose with a heap of bounty, and all of us poor folks will have all we want to eat and plenty to clothe us with. It can't always keep getting worse and worse every year like it has since the big war. God, he'll put a stop to it some of these days and make the rich give back all they've took from us poor folks. God is going to treat us right. He ain't going to let it keep on like it is now. But we got to stop cussing him when we ain't got nothing to eat. He'll send a man to hell and the devil for persisting in doing that. Love dragged the sack of turn turnips across the drain ditch and sat down again. Jeter laid aside the rotten inner tube and waited. Chapter 2 Love opened the sack, selected a large turnip, wiping it clean with his hands, and took three bites one after the other. The Lester woman stood in the yard and on the porch looking at Love eat. Ellie May came from behind the china berry tree and sat down not far from Love on the pine stump. Ada and the old grandmother were on the porch watching the turnip and Love's hand become smaller and smaller with each bite. Now, if Pearl was anything like Ellie Mae, she wouldn't act like she does, Love said. I'd have taken Ellie Mae at the start if it wasn't for the fact if it wasn't for the face of hers. But I know that I couldn't sleep with no peace of mind at night with her in the bed with me, and knowing how it looked in the daylight, Pearl looks pretty. And she's a right smart piece to want to sleep with. But I just can't make her stay off of that darn pallet on the floor when night comes. You got to come down there and make her do it like she ought to act, Jeter. I've been married to her near on to a whole year. And all that time, I could just as well have been shoveling coal at the shoot night and day without ever going to my house. That ain't the way it was intended for her to be. A man has a right to want his wife to get in the bed when dark comes. I know I ain't never heard of a woman wanting to sleep on the darn pallet on the floor every night in the whole year. Pearl is queer that way. By God and by Jesus, dude, Jeter said. Ain't you never gonna stop bouncing that there ball, that there old house? You've clear about got all the weather boards knocked off already. The darn old house is gonna pitch over and fall to the ground some of these days if you don't stop doing that. Jeter picked up the inner tube again and tried to make the patch stick to the rubber. The old automobile against which he was sitting was the last of his possessions. The year before, the cow had died, leaving him with the car. Up until that time, he had a way of boasting about his goods. But when the cow went, he did not even mention the car anymore. He had begun to think that he was indeed a poor man. No longer was there anything he could mortgage when the time came each spring to buy seed cotton and guano. The automobile had been turned down at the junkyard in Augusta, but he still had wood to sell. It was the wiry blackjack that grew behind the house. He was trying now to patch the inner tube so he could haul a load of it to Augusta sometime that week. Adas said all the meal was gone and the meat too. They had been living off of fat back rinds several days already, and after they were gone, there would be nothing for them to eat. A load of blackjack would bring 50 or 75 cents in Augusta if he could find a man to buy it. When the old cow had died, Jeter hauled the carcass to the fertilizer plant in Augusta and received two dollars and a quarter for it. After that, there was nothing left to sell but blackjack. Quit chunking that darn ball at their weather boards, dude, he said. You don't ever stop doing what I tell you. That ain't no way to treat your old pa, dude. You ought to sort of help me out instead of always doing something contrary. Ah, oh, go to hell, you old dried up clod, dude said, throwing the ball at the side of the house with all his might and scooping up a fast grounder on the rebound. Nobody asks you nothing. The old grandmother, Jeter's mother, crawled under the front porch for the old bury up sack and went across the tobacco road towards the grove for some dead twigs. No one paid any attention to her. Wood for the kitchen stove and fireplace was never cut and hauled to the house. Jeter would not do it, and he could not make dude do that kind of work. Old Mother Lester knew there was 
no food for them to cook and that it would be a waste of time for her to go after the dead twigs and make fire in the cook still. But she was hungry and she was always hoping that God would provide for them if she made a fire in the kitchen at mealtime. Knowing that there were turnips in Lao's sack made her frantic with hunger. She could sometimes stand the pain of it in her stomach when she knew there was nothing to eat. But when Lao stood in full view taking turnips out the sack, she could not bear the sight of seeing food no one would let her have. She hobbled across the road and over the old cotton field that had not been planted and cultivated in six or seven years. The field had grown up in broom sedge at the start and now gnarled in sharp t stubs of a new blackjack growth were beginning to cover the ground. She tripped and fell several times on her way to the grove of trees, and her clothes had been torn so many times before that the new tears in the skirt and jacket could not be distinguished from the older ones. The coat and shirt she wore had been to torn into strips and shreds by the briars and blackjack pricks in the thicket where she gathered up the dead twigs for firewood, and there never had been new clothes for her. Hobbling through the brown broom said she looked like an old scarecrow in her black rags. The February wind whistled through the strips of black cloth, whirling them about in the air until it looked as if she were shaking violently with palsy. Her stockings had been made by wrapping some of the longer of the black rags around her legs and tying the ends with knots. Her shoes were pieces of horse collars cut into squares and tied around her feet with strings. She went after the dead twigs morning, noon, and night. When she returned to the house each time, she made a fire in the cook stove and sat down to eat. Alda shifted the snuff stick to the other side of her mouth and looked longingly at Love and his sack of turnips. She held a loose calico dress over her chest to keep out the cool February wind blowing under the roof of the porch. Everyone else was sitting or standing in the sunshine. Ellie Mae got down from the pine stump and sat on the ground. She moved closer and closer to Love, sliding herself over the hard white sand. Is you in mind to make a trade with them turnips? Jeter asked Love. I want turnips. God himself only knows bad. I ain't trading turnips to nobody, he said. Now, love, that ain't no way to talk. I ain't had a good turnip since a year ago this spring. All the turnips I've had has got them damn blasted green gutter worms in them. I sure would like to have some good turnips right now. Warmy ones like mine was ain't fit for a human. Go over to Fuller and buy yourself some then, he said, eating the last of his fourth turnip. I went over there to get mine. Now, love, ain't I always been good to you? That ain't no way for you to talk. You know I ain't got a penny to my name and no knowing where to get the money. You got a good job and it pays you a heap of money. You ought to make a trade with me so I'll have something to eat and won't starve to death. You don't want to sit there and see me starve, do you, love? I don't make but a dollar a day at the shoot. House rent takes up near about all of that and eating the rest of it. Makes no difference, love. I ain't got a penny to my name and you is. I can't help that. The Lord looks at us with equal favor, they say. He gives me mine, and if you don't get yours, you better go talk to him about it. It ain't none of my troubles. I've got plenty of my own to worry about. Pearl won't never, ain't you never gonna stop chunking that darn ball against the house, dude? Jeter shouted. That noise near about splits my poor head wide open. Dude slammed his baseball against the loose weatherboards with all his might. Pieces of splintered pine fell over the yard and rotten chunks dropped to the ground beside the house. Dude threw the ball harder each time, it seemed, and several times the ball almost went through the thin walls of the house. Why don't you go somewhere and steal a sack of turnips, dude said. You ain't fit for nothing else no more. You sit around here and cuss all the time about not having nothing to eat and no turnips. Why don't you go somewhere and steal yourself something? God ain't gonna bring you nothing. He ain't gonna drop no turnips down out of the sky. He ain't got no time to be wasted on fooling with you if you wasn't so darn lazy. You'd do something instead of cuss about it all the time. My children all blame me because God sees fit to make me poverty written law, Jeter said. They and Ma all the time cussing me because we ain't got nothing to eat. I ain't had nothing to do with it. It ain't my fault that Captain John shut down on giving us rations and snuff. It's his fault, Law. I worked all my life for Captain John. I worked harder than any of the four blank in the field. And the first thing I know, he came down here one morning and says he can't be letting me get no more rations and snuff at the store. After that, he sells all the mules and goes up to Augusta to live. I can't make no money because there ain't nobody wanted to want and work done. Nobody is taking on sharecroppers neither. Ain't no kind of work I can find to do for hire. I can't even raise me a crop of my own because I ain't got no mule in the first place. And besides that, won't nobody let me have seed, cotton, and guano on credit. Now I can't get no snuff and rations, except in once in a while when I had, when I haul a load of wood up to Augusta. 
Captain John told the merchants in Fuller not to let me have no more snuffing rations on his credit, and I don't know where to get nothing. I'd raise a crop of my own on this land if I could get somebody to sign my guano notes, but nobody would do that for me. Neither. That's what I wanted to do powerful strong right now. When the winter goes and when it gets to be time to burn off the broom sedge in the fields and the underbush and the thickets, I sort of want to cry. I reckon it is. The smell of that sedge smoke this time of the year near drives me crazy. Then pretty soon all of the farmers start plowing. That's what gets under my skin the worst. When the smell of that new earth turning over behind the plow strikes me, I get all weak and shaky. It's in my blood. Burning broom sedge and plowing in the ground this time of year. I did it for near about 50 years and my pa and his pa before him was the same kind of men. Us listers sure like to stir the earth and make plants grow in it. I can't move off to cotton mills like the rest of them do. The land has got a powerful hold on me. This raft of women and children is all time bellowing for snuff and rations too. It don't make no difference that I ain't got nothing to buy it with. They want it just the same. I reckon, love, I'll just have to wait for the good Lord to provide. They tell me he takes care of his people, and I'm waiting for him to take some notice of me. I don't reckon there's another man between here and Augusta who's as bad off as I is. And down the other way, neither, between here and McCoy. It looks like everyone's got goods and credit except in me. I don't know why that is, because I always give the good Lord his due. Him and me has always been fair and square with each other. It's time for him to take some notice of the fix I'm in. I don't know nothing else to do except wait. For him to take notice. It don't do me no good to try to beg snuff and rations because ain't nobody going to give it to me. I tried all over this part of the country, but nobody paid no attention to my request. They say they ain't got nothing either, but I can't see how that is. It don't look like everybody ought to be poverty written just because they live on the land instead of going to the mills. If I've been a sinful man, I don't know what it is I've done. I don't seem to remember anything I've done powerful sinful. It didn't used to be like this. Either. I can recall a short time back when all the merchants in Fuller was tickled to give me credit. And I always had plenty of money to spend then too. Cotton was selling upwards of 30 cents a pound and nobody came around to collect debts. Then all of a sudden, the merchants in Fuller wouldn't let me have no more goods on time. And pretty soon the sheriff comes and takes away near about every darn piece of goods I possess. He took every darn thing I had except the old automobile and the cow. He said the cow wasn't no good because she wouldn't take no freshening and the automobile tires all worn out. And now I can't get no credit. I can't hire out for pay. Nobody wants to take on sharecroppers. If the good Lord don't start bringing me help pretty soon, it will be too late to help me with my troubles. Jeter paused to see if Love were listening. Love had his head turned in yet another direction. He was looking at Ellie May now. She had at last got him to give her some attention. Ellie May was edging closer and closer to Love. She was moving across the yard by raising her weight on her hands and her feet and sliding herself over the hard white sand. She was smiling at Love and trying to make him take more notice of her. She could not wait any longer for him to come over, so she was going to him. Her hair lip was spread open across her upper teeth, making her mouth appear as though she had no upper lip at all. Men usually would have nothing to do with that Ellie May. But she was 18 now and she was beginning to discover that it should be possible for her to get a man in spite of her appearance. Ellie Mae's acting like your old hound used to do when he got the itch, dude said Jester. Look at her scrape her bottom on the sand. That old hound used to make the same kind of sound Ellie Mae's making too. It sounds like just like a little pig squealing, don't it? By God and by Jesus, love, I want to get some good eating turnips, Sheeter said. I ain't. Eat nothing all winter but meal and fat back, and I'm want to turn up something powerful. All the ones I raised has got them damn blasted green gutted worms in them. Where'd you get them turnips at anyway, love? Maybe we can make some sort of trade or, or another. I always treated you fair and square. You ought to give me some, seeing as I ain't got none. I'll go down to your house the first thing in the morning and tell Pearl she has got to stop acting like she does. It's a darn shame for a girl to do that way she's treating you. I'll tell her she's got to let you have your rights with her. I never heard of a darn girl sleeping on a pallet on the floor when her husband has got a bed for her. No how. Pearl won't keep that up after I tell her about it. There ain't no way to treat a man when he's gone to to the bother of marrying. It's time she was knowing it too. I'll go down there the first thing in the morning and tell her to get in the bed. Love was paying no attention to Jeter now. He was watching Ellie Mae slide across the yard towards him. When she came a little closer, he reached in the sack and took out another turnip and began taking big bites out of it. He did not bother to wipe the sand from it this time. Ada shifted the snuff stick to the other side of her mouth again and watched Ellie Mae and Love with gaping jaw. Dude stood watching Ellie Mae too. 
Ellie Mae's gonna get herself full sand if she don't stop doing that, dude said. Your old hound used to never to keep it up that long a time. He didn't squeal at all the time. He didn't squeal all the time neither, like she's doing. By God and Jesus, love, Jeter said. I want turnips. I could come near about chewing up a whole croaker's sink between now and bedtime tonight. Chapter 3 Jeter's reiterated and insistent plea for turnips was having less and less effect upon Long. He was not aware that anyone was talking to him. He was interested only in Ellie Mae now. Ellie Mae's straining for love, ain't she? Dude said, nudging Jeter with his foot. She's liable to bust it gut if she don't look out. The inner tube Jeter was attempting to patch again was on the verge of falling into pieces. The tires themselves were in a condition even more rotten. And the Ford car, 14 years old that year, appeared as if it would never stand together long enough for Jeter to put the tire back on the wheel, much less, much less last until it could be loaded with blackjack for a trip to Augusta. The touring car's top had been missing for seven or eight years, and the one remaining fender was linked to a body with a piece of rusty balling wire. All the springs and horsehair had disappeared from the upholstery. The children had taken the seats apart to find out what was on the inside, and nobody had made an attempt to put them together again. The appearance of the automobile had not been improved by the dropping off of the radiator in the road somewhere several years before, and a rusty lard can with a hole punched in the bottom was wired to the water pipe on top of the engine in its place. The lard can filled to fill excuse me, the lard can failed to fill the need for a radiator, but it was much better than nothing. When Jeter got ready to go somewhere, he filled the lard pail to overflowing, jumped in, and drove until the water splashed out and the engine locked up the heat. He would get out then and look for a creek so he could fill the pail again. The whole car was like that. Chickens had roasted on it when there were chickens at the Lester's to roast, and it was speckled like a guinea hen. Now that there were no chickens on the place, no one had ever taken the trouble to wash it off. Jeter had never thought of doing such a thing, and neither had any of the others. Ellie Mae had dragged herself from one end of the yard to the opposite side. She was now within reach of love, where she sat by his sack of turnips. She was bolder, too, than she had ever been before, and she had love looking at her and undisturbed by the sight of her hair lip. Ellie Mae's upper lip had an opening of a quarter of an inch wide that divided one side of her mouth into unequal parts. The split came to an to an abrupt end almost under her left nostril the upper gum was low and because her gums were always fiery red the opening in her lip made her look as if her mouth were bleeding profusely jeter had been saying for 15 years that he was going to have ellie may's lips sewed together but he had not yet got around to doing it dude picked up a piece of rotted weatherboard that had been knocked from the house and threw it at his father he did not take his gaze from ellie may in love however their actions and ellie may's behavior held him spellbound what do you want now, dude? Jeter said. What's the matter with you chunking weather bounding at me like that? Ellie May's horse and dude said. Jeter glanced across the yard where Love and Ellie May were sitting close together. The trunk of a china berry tree partly obscured his view of all that was taking place, but he could see that she was sitting on Love's outstretched legs, astride his knees, and that he was offering her a turnip from the sack bes beside him. Ellie May's horse and ain't she, Pa, dude said. I reckon I've done the wrong thing by marrying Pearl to love, Jeter said. Pearl just made, Pearl just ain't made up to be Love's woman. She don't take no interest in Love's wants and she don't give a cuss what ain't nobody thinks about it. She ain't the kind of guy to be a wife to love. She's queer. I reckon somehow she wants to be going to Augusta like the other gals done. None of them ever was satisfied staying here. They ain't like me because I think more of the land than I do about staying in the darn cotton mill. You can't smell no sedge fire up there. And when it comes time to break the land for planting, you feel sick inside, but you don't know what's ailing you. People has told me about that spring sickness in the mills. I don't know how many times, but when a man stays on the land, he don't get to feeling like that this time of year because he's right here to smell the smoke of burning broom sedge and to feel the wind fresh off plowed fields going down inside of his body. So instead of feeling sick and not knowing what's wrong in his body, as it happens in the darn mills, out here on the land, a man feels better than he ever did. The springtime ain't gonna let... Excuse me. The springtime ain't going to let you fool it by hiding away inside a darn cotton mill. It knows you got to stay in the land to feel good. That's because humans made the mills. God made the land, but you don't see him building darn cotton mills. That's how I know better than to go up there like the rest of them. I say where God made a place for me. 
Ellie Mae's acting like she's Lav's woman, dude said. Ada shifted the weight off her body from one foot to the other. She was standing in the same place on the porch that she had been when Lav first came into the yard. She had been watching Lav and Ellie Mae for a long time without looking anywhere else. Maybe God intended for it to be such, Jeter said. Maybe he knows more about it than us mortals do. God is a wise old, wise old somebody. You can't fool him. He takes care of little details us humans never stop to think about. That's why I ain't leaving this land and going to Augusta to live in a darn cotton mill. He put me here and he ain't never told me to get off and go up there. That's why I'm staying on the land. If I was to haul off and go to the mills, it might be hell to pay, coming and going. God might get mad because I done it and strike me dead. Or on the other hand, he might let me stay there until my natural death, but hound me all the time with little devilish things. That's the way he makes his punishments sometimes. He just lets us stay on, slow like, and hound. Lag us very stiff until we wish we was a long time dead in the ground. That's why I ain't going to the mills with a big rush like all them other folks around Fuller did. They got up there and all of them had mighty pain inside for the land but they can't come back they gotta stay now that's what god's done to them for leaving the land he's going to the hound them every step they take until they die look at that horse in lma's doing dude said that's horsing from way back yonder by god and by jesus love jeter shouted across the yard what about them there turnips has they got them damn blasted green gutter worms in them like my hand i've been wanting some goody in turnips since way back last spring if captain john had sold up all his mules and shut off letting me get guano on his credit i could have raised me a whooping big mess of turnips this year but when he sold the mules and moved to augusta he said he wasn't going to ruin himself by letting us tenants break him buying guano on his credit in fuller he said there wasn't no sense in trying to run a farm no more. 50 plows or one plow. He said he can make more money out of farming by not running plows. And that's why we ain't got no snuff and rations no more. Ada says she's just bound to have a little snuff now and then because it sort of starves off hunger. And it does. Every time I sell a load of wood, I get about a dozen jars of snuff. Even if I ain't got the money to buy meal and meat. Because snuff is something a man is just bound to have. When I has a sharp pain in the belly, I can take a little snuff and not feel hungry the rest of the day. Snuff is a powerful help to keep a man living. But I couldn't raise no turnips this year. I didn't have no meal and I didn't have no guano. Oh, and I had a few measly little rows out there in the field. But a man can't run no farm unless he's got a mule to plow with. A hoe ain't no good except to chop cotton with and corn. Ain't no sense in trying to grow turnips with a hoe. I reckon that's why the damn blasted green gutter worms got in them turnips. I didn't have no mule to cultivate them with. That's why... They was all wormy. Have you been paying attention to what I was saying, love? You ain't ever answered me about them turnips yet. I got a powerful gnawing in my belly for turnips. I reckon I like winter turnips just about as bad as a blank likes watermelons. I can't see no difference between the two ways. Turnips is about the best eaten no I know about. Love did not look up. He was saying something to Ellie Mae and listening to what she was saying. Love had always told Jeter that he would never have anything to do with Ellie Mae because she had a hair lip. At the time, he had made a bargain with Jeter about Pearl. He said he might consider taking Ellie May if Jeter would take her to Augusta and get a doctor to sew up her mouth. Jeter had thought the matter over thoroughly and decided that it would be best to let Love take Pearl. Because of the cost of sewing up the hair lip would probably amount to more than what he was getting out of the arrangement. Letting Love take Pearl was an all clear profit to Jeter. Love had given him some quilts and nearly a gallon of cylinder oil, besides giving him all a week's pay, which was $7. The money was what Jeter wanted more than anything else, but the other things were badly needed too. Jeter had not intended had been intending to take Ellie Mae to a doctor ever since she was three or four years old, so that when a man came to marry her, there would be no drawbacks. But with First one thing and then another turning up every now and then, Jeter had never been able to get around to it. Someday he would take her though. He told himself that every time he had the occasion to think about it. At the time Love had married Pearl, he said he liked Ellie Mae more than he did her, but that he did not want to have a wife with a hair lip. He knew the Negroes would laugh at him. That was the summer before, several weeks before he had begun to like Pearl so much that he was doing everything he could think of to make her stop sleeping on a pallet on the floor. Pearl's long yellow curls hanging down her back and her pale blue eyes turned Love's head. He thought there was a more beautiful girl. Excuse me, he thought there was not a more beautiful girl anywhere in the world. And for that matter, no man who had ever had the opportunity of seeing Pearl had ever gone away without thinking the same thing. It would have been impossible for her to dress herself or even to disfigure herself in a way that would make her plain or ordinary looking. She became more beautiful day by day. But Love's wishes were unheeded. 
Pearl, if it was possible, was more determined than ever by that time to keep away from him. And now that Ellie Mae had dragged herself all the way across the yard and was now sitting on his legs, Love was thinking only of Ellie Mae. Aside from her hair lip, Ellie Mae was just as desirable as the next girl Mae would find in the Sand Hill country surrounding the town of Fuller. Love was fully aware of that. He had tried them all, white girls and black. Love ain't thinking about no turnips, you'd said in reply to his father. Love's wanting to hang up with Ellie Mae. He don't care nothing about the way her face looks now. He ain't aiming to kiss her. Ain't nobody gonna kiss her. But that ain't saying nobody would fool with her. I heard Blanks talking about it not long ago down the road at the old sawmill. They said she could get all the men she wanted if she would keep her face hid. Quit chunking that there ball against the old house, Jeter said angrily. You'll have that wall worn clear in two if you don't stop doing that all the time. The, this old house ain't gonna stand up much longer no way. The way you chuck that ball is going to pitch over and fall on the ground some of these days. I declare, I wish you had more sense than you got. The old grandmother came hobbling out of the field with a sack of dead twigs on her back. She shuffled her feet through the deep sand of the tobacco road and scuffed them over the hard sand of the yard, looking neither to the right nor to the left. At the bottom of the front steps, she dropped the load from the shoulder and sat down to rest a while before going to the kitchen. Her groans were louder than usual as she began rubbing her sides, sitting on the bottom step with her feet in the sand and her chest almost touching her sharp knees. She looked more than ever like a loosey tied bag of soiled black rags she was unmindful of the people around her and no one was more than passingly aware that she had been anywhere or had returned if she had gone to the thicket and had not returned no one would have known for several days that she was dead jeter watched law from the corners of his eyes while he tried to make another patch stick to the cracked rubber inner tube he had noticed that law was several yards from the sack of turnips and he waited patiently while the distance grew more and more each minute Love had forgotten how important the safety of the turnips was. So long as Ellie may continue to tousle his hair with her hands, you'd forget that he had turnips. She made him forget everything. What you reckon they're going to do next, you'd said. Maybe Love's going to take her down to the coal chute and keep her there all day. Ada, who had been standing on the porch all that time as motionless as one of the uprights, suddenly pulled her dress tighter over her chest. The cool February wind was barely to be felt out in the sun, but on the porch and in the shade, it went straight to the bones. Ada had been ill with Pellegra for several years, and she had said she was always cold except in midsummer. Lob's gonna big her, dude said. He's getting ready to do it right now, too. Look at him crawl around. He acts like an old stud horse. He ain't never let her get that close before. He said he would never get close enough to Ellie May to touch her with a stick because he don't like the looks of her mouth but he ain't paying no mind to it now is he i bet he don't even know she's got a slit lip on her if he does know it he don't give a goddamn now several negroes were coming up the road walking towards fuller they were several hundred feet away when they first noticed the lesters in love in the yard but it was not until they were almost in front of the house that they noticed what love and ellie may were doing in the farther side near china berry tree they stopped laughing and talking and slowed down until they were almost standing still Dude hollered at them, calling their names, but none of them spoke. They stopped and watched. Howdy, Captain Love, one of them said. Love did not hear. The Lesters paid no more attention to the Negroes. Negroes passing the house were in the habit of looking at the Lesters, but very few of them ever had anything to say. Among themselves, they talked about the Lesters and laughed about them. They spoke to other white people, stopping at their houses to talk. Love was one of the white persons with whom they liked to talk. Cheater screwed the pump hose into the inner tube valve and tried to work some air inside. The pump was rusty, the stem was bent, and the hose was cracked at the base so badly that the air escaped before it ever had a chance to reach the valve. It would take Jeter a week to pump 30 pounds of air into the tire at that rate. He could have put more air into the tires if he had attempted to blow them up with his mouth. It looks like I ain't gonna get started to Augusta with a load of wood before next week. He said, I wish I had a mule. I could haul a load there near about every day if I had one. The last time I drove this automobile to Augusta, every one of them darn tires went flat before I could get there and back. I reckon about the best thing to do is fill them all full of holes and ride that way. That's what a man told me to do, and I reckon he was just about right. These old inner tubes and tires ain't much good no longer. The three Negroes went a few steps further down the road and stopped again. They stayed within sight of the yard, waiting to see what Love was doing. After he had not answered them the first time they spoke, they knew he did not want them to bother him again. Dude had thrown the baseball aside and had walked closer to Ellie May and Love. He sat down on the ground close to them and waited to see what they were going to do next. Love had stopped eating turnips and Ellie May had eaten only a part of one. Them blank don't believe Love's going to, Dude said. They said, they said down at the old sawmill 
that wouldn't nobody fool with Ellie Mae unless it was in the nighttime. I reckon Love would say so himself afterwards. End of chapters 1 to 3